answer, Chris. Okay. Hi, I see we have Mary Pelletier here too, who is our new liaison to town council. Welcome, Mary. I've been meaning to give you a call. Every time you've been on our meetings, when I go to mention that you're there, you're already gone. So we keep missing you. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. I'm glad you could join us. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thank you. Are we missing anybody? I assume iPhone is Damien since he yes. just sent a message. Yeah, he just, he just texted me. He's on the road, so he's just going to listen in. Okay. So I think we're all set, Ken, whenever you're ready to take over the show. Good evening, everybody. Um, Good evening. My, name's, my name's Ken Slater, in, uh, town attorney, uh, and general town attorney, but we've, I am representing a number of towns and also in some, an instance where uh, I was telling Jennifer today, one of my, my favorite cases when I was actually representing an order of um, of nuns that were operating a Montessori school in Enfield, and they were looking to get a certificate of appropriateness for a parking lot that was essentially invisible from Enfield Street, which was a historic district. Uh, and one of my favorite cases was on appeal. I had forty, uh, somewhere between thirty and forty um, ladies in habits who came to the Superior Court, and they were putting us in a tiny little superior courtroom. They had to put us in the big courtroom. And then I ended up in, uh, later on in the Supreme Connecticut Supreme Court. And the same thing, I had 40 or so ladies behind me in habit. So I thought I was on the right side of that particular case and got my decision on Christmas Eve and, and we, we prevailed. But uh, more often than not, um, I'm representing towns that have historic district commissions. And most of the times it doesn't involve uh, litigation. Um, and I've done some some training, and we often do training for our land use commissioners. So, what I plan to do tonight, and certainly take questions at the end, which uh, I'll reserve the right to say I don't know, and get back to you on some of those, because <laughs> it's surprising how often that can happen. Uh, but my my plan was to just overview, and I know we have some veterans, and we have some folks that are newer to the commission, uh, but to just quickly overview, you know, what your authority is under the statute. And then segue uh, from there into a presentation involving you know, some of the, the, the do's and don'ts and, and of, oper of holding meetings and hearings uh, and, and running them effectively. So I was going to start in the second part is an actual slideshow. The first part is just I have the general statutes related to historic districts uh, in a basically in a word document and I have certain parts highlighted. So I'm hoping not to make you dizzy um, in scrolling down on the first document, but I'll I'll start there and, and I'll ask the, the chair. Is that uh, is that a, a good way to proceed? Should I just start with uh, going through the uh, whatever you have planned is fine. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. What do you see? You see a a uh, start of chapter a PowerPoint? Nine. Yep, chapter 97A. Okay, excellent. Because it's uh, in some of these uh, software, it puts a highlight over what, I'm, what we're looking at. And sometimes it doesn't, and this one doesn't. So this is the start of the chapter that, that you folks are operating under. And this is the dizzy part. I'm going to jump through. This is how it's established. You're well established. Uh, and I, one of the, the, uh, the older of the historic districts. I think Litchfield might be the oldest, but um, doesn't it really, it, that isn't important. But we'll get down to the, the part that, that matters is once it's formed, uh, what you, as you were formulated, the statute provides for a five member uh, commission who all have to be electors and one or more of the members uh, shall reside in the historic district. And I will say there was a period of time I actually lived in your historic district. I lived shortly after law school, which is in the very early 90s, I lived on, on Hartford Avenue. Uh, but I can't tell you the, 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 uh, the number of the place that I lived in, but I very much in, enjoyed living there for the time that I did. Uh, the chairman is, in, in some commissions, there's different mechanisms in which alternates are selected. 
Uh, this is the most common way the chairman uh, will select any alternates to act. Um, I'll touch on when we get to the part of, of participating in hearings and presentations, the role of an alternate uh, in, in that session, but it's uh, part of the session, but it, it's selected by the, the chair. Uh, you can adopt rules of procedure, and that's your your ordinance in, in Weathersfield is pretty simple. You essentially are incorporating this statute uh, in, as your powers. You're acting in accordance with the statute. So your ordinance doesn't just go chapter and verse through all of the sections of, of the statute. So you'd look to, to this to get some of the criteria uh, that you go by. So, so jumping down, um, you know, certificates of appropriateness is your bread and butter as the veteran, as veterans know. Um, and so the title of this section 7-147D, certificate appropriateness that, uh, colon parking areas. I'll start with the parking areas because those are pretty nar narrowly defined in, in where the parking areas are is when it's used under D here which is no area within a historic district shall be used for industrial, commercial, business, home industry, or additional parking, um, whether or not it is owned for such use until after a certificate of appropriation is issued by your commission. In a, in a few minutes, I'll touch on what the criteria are for a parking area, but it's not all parking areas. A residential parking area is not, um, is not subject to jurisdiction if it's when industrial, commercial, business, home industry, or occupational. So back up to the top, this is your, your main bread and butter is no building or structure shall be erected or altered within historic district until after an application for certificate of appropriateness as to exterior architectural features has been submitted to your commission. And then that's part A, uh, no building permit um, for erection of a building structure alteration of an exterior architectural feature um, or, or no demolition permit for demolition or removal of a building uh, shall be issued until a certificate of appropriateness ha um, has been issued. Uh, and then this part of the green, I've kind of alternated different sections I want to highlight between the blue and the green. There's no rhyme or reason other than to distinguish, you know, one section from another that I wanted to highlight. So in this case, a certificate, it, it's not triggered by the need for a building permit. So it points out a certificate of appropriate shall not be uh, shall be required whether or not a building permit is required. So if you're doing the activities that are mentioned, building alteration for exterior uh, architectural features, then uh, you can require a certificate of appropriateness. Uh, and by the way, somebody could speak. If somebody has a question, I will give time at the end for questions. But with a small group like yours, if as I'm going through, you see something or I say something that is confusing or um, you, know, you want to elaborate on, just please speak up. And, and if somebody's raised their hand and I don't notice because I'm looking at my screen, just again, speak up and I, I, can, I can touch on it. Um, so what needs to be submitted? Well, you, you have a handbook, you have guidance to people of the kinds of things that are submitted. From a statutory standpoint, um, it says you can require pl whatever plans, elevations, specifications, material, or other information. And then for demolition, including in the case of demolition, a statement of the proposed condition and appearance after the, the, the building is removed uh, as you deem necessary. So you have a fair amount of discretion in determining um, what kinds of material, what kind of information uh, you will require in considering a certificate of appropriateness and included in the statute, the style, material, size, and location of outdoor advertising signs and bill posters within the historic district shall also be under, under your control. Um, now, content uh, of, of signs, there's First Amendment rights um, that are at issue. Um, I actually you know, was involved in a situation where there was a, a um, a, a dispute regarding a congregational church in Eastern Connecticut that was putting put up a sign uh, without uh, getting a certificate of appropriateness and ended up uh, working it out. And the sign really needed, you know, some some modifications to fit into the historic district, uh, but it was worked out and and, and resolved. Uh, the you shall not be construed to extend to the color of paint used. So. 
while you, you know, some of the, the features are something that comes under your jurisdiction. Uh, even if you may prefer that, you know, a certain, you know, barn red be used on, on, on something that that's not something that you can require. Um, certainly they, they can share that information. You can ask them, you know, what, what they plan to do, but you certainly cannot decide whether or not to issue the certificate based on color or deny a certificate because you're unhappy with the color. Um, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Slater, while you're there, uh, but that is just paint. I assume that does not pertain to other materials, correct? It's right. This is the, col the color of the paint used on the exterior. So if someone okay. is using, a, is going to construct something like they were going to put a gate up or something, and it was going to be chrome, uh, and it obviously didn't fit into the into the character of the uh, historic district. That's something that you do have jurisdiction over. It's the, it's the paint used on the exterior of a building. So other objects, color of objects that aren't going to fit in, is something that the statutes don't 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 uh, prohibit you from considering. That's just the building. So like, is that covered siding, but a fence not covered? You know, I haven't seen a case on 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 siding. I I would recommend to you if you asked me the question and somebody came to you and said that, you know, if your only problem was the color of the siding, um, I don't think there's any reported case about whether this color of paint used, whether that would apply to the color of the siding. I would tell you I would expect that it would that the that they would, but I. You can't take that to the bank because there's there's no case that I'm aware of, uh, but I, I don't think they would distinguish between if you were going to be allowing uh, a a kind of a siding um, and you just weren't happy with the color. I think you'd have a problem. Uh, but we do but, we do just, routinely um, rule on the siding color because it's deemed a permanent um, with the vinyl siding deemed a permanent change because you can't paint that. Um, I think maybe if there turned out to be a paintable product, you know, when we get someone in with um, hardy plank and that sort of thing, that's a paintable product like wood. And so mm -hmm. they're left to their discretion with that. But with the permanent products, we do regulate the color as well. Fair enough. Um, I'm telling you that I've not seen any, any case on that. And you could go with the plain language it says to extend to the color of paint used and what you're describing is siding, it's already colored that way. So right. um, you very, mel very, very well may prevail if there ever was a, a, a dispute on that. And they should use you know, color, plain language. So um, it does, I, I wouldn't want to handicap it if, there, if there's a challenge on that. If that's what you've been doing, I think you can certainly stand on the fact that they're not proposing to paint the exterior, they're proposing to use uh, a pre-colored uh, material and for that reason you, you consider it. All right, so when you get an application for a certificate of appropriateness, you have to hold a public hearing. Uh, and I, I won't go into the details of notice. You're, you know, the town, town staff, I'm, I'm guessing, are involved in doing, doing that. There's a requirement uh, that normal parliamentary rule is built into the statute that you have to have a, a, a quorum is a majority of the members um, and a concurring vote of the majority of members shall be necessary to issue a certificate of appropriateness. Um, so what that says is a, a concurring vote of the majority of the members. Ordinarily, um, the, if, you have a, if you have a quorum, it's a majority of the quorum that's required to move, move motions. So if you had a five member commission and three people show up, three people can, can move business and a vote could be two to one. And that would be an action on behalf of the commission. Under the historic commission statute, you need at least three votes, three members of the regular commission in order to approve a certificate of appropriateness. So if you had only three members in attendance, all three would have to vote in favor of granting the, the certificate uh, in order to uh, in order to prevail. So a, a two to one vote in favor of a certificate of appropriateness would result in a denial. 
it has a deadline that you're supposed to act within uh, 65 days. There's a case that in, in the land use context, there are certain instances in which if you don't act, it's considered an automatic approval. And our courts have said that in the absence of language in the statute that has, that, that states what the result would be if you miss it, um, such as an automatic approval. If you don't, there's some statutes that if an agency doesn't make a report within a certain period of time, it's considered to be an affirmative uh, report. Uh, and you know, in, in the context of land use subdivisions and site plans, if somebody doesn't act on time, then they can be automatically approved. But other kinds of land use commission decisions where there is no penalty or remedy for failure to act within 65 days, then it's a directory deadline and not a mandatory one. So there's a case uh, dealing with historic district commissions that uh, failure to hit that deadline. Now you should try to hit that deadline. That's the statute uh, wants you to act. Uh, but if you don't, it doesn't result in automatic issuance of certificate of appropriateness. You have to issue a certificate of appropriateness by, by an affirmative vote by a majority of your membership. Now, if you make a denial, um, you're supposed to prov you provide a notice of the reasons in which you've denied it. Um, and you can, in those reasons, you can simply give the reasons why it wasn't satisfactory. But it also specifically states that you can make recommendations regarding the design, arrangement, texture, material, or similar features in your denial. So you can give you know, a roadmap, theoretically, to an applicant who has been denied on, on what they might be able to do to get the approval. Um, so the All right, so consideration and determine an appropriateness. Um, and if the commission determines um, that the proposed erection alteration will be appropriate, it issues a certificate of appropriateness. And in considering it, uh, the commission shall consider pertinent factors in addition to other pertinent factors. So it's not these stated per stated ones are not all you could consider. If there's something that uh, there's some evidence on, you're just not making it up, but there's something that, that's relevant to or there's something's appropriate in the district, um, you, you know, if you're going to deny, you'd have to state what that was. But you should consider or can consider type and style of exterior windows, doors, light fixture signs, above ground utilities, mechanical appurtenances, type and texture of building materials, um, in passing on appropriateness as to exterior architectural features, you can consider historical and architectural value and significance, arch architectural style, scale, general design, arrangement, texture. So that's all spelled out in the statute. Now, there's a special consideration when you're dealing with uh, things that are um, involve renewable energy particularly you know, they reference solar energy, but they leave it open for perhaps other technology that deals with renewable energy. And it gives you a, a heightened burden that says you, if, if you're gonna deny something that relates to renewable energy, you have to find that the feature cannot be installed without substantially impairing, impairing the historic character and appearance of the district. Um, and the certificate of appropriateness for such a feature, that is a renewable energy feature, may include stipulations requiring design modifications and limitations on the location, uh, which do not significantly appear its effectiveness. So, you know, that can, you need to, to draw that information out of an applicant, or you'd need to get your own consultant um, if you were going to simply mandate a change how do you know whether it's going to significantly impair its effectiveness? Now, maybe by drawing that information out of the applicant, requiring the applicant to give you uh, more information, you know, giving the sort of the what if, if I, if you changed it from here to here, you know, please provide information as to whether or not that would uh, significantly impair its effectiveness. That's something that's built into, into that, into the statute for consideration on renewable uh, energy sources. Now there's a special standard here for dealing with parking. Um, and again, back to what we talked about, or I talked about earlier, it's parking for basically industrial and commercial uses, home, occupation included. 
uh, but in passing on the appropriateness of parking, you should take into consideration the size of the area, the visibility of cars parked therein, the closeness of such areas to adjacent buildings and other similar factors. Uh, so it gives you separate criteria for that. Uh, and the next part, uh, in, it says in your deliberations, your commission should act only for the purpose of controlling the erection or alteration of buildings, structures, or parking, which are incongruous with the historic or architectural aspects of the district. The commission shall not consider interior arrangements. So, I mean, I think that should go without uh, without saying, but the, the what's going on inside the building is, is not where your jurisdiction lies. Um, so any use or any layout inside it is not not your consideration, but the, way, the manner in which the aesthetics and, and fitting into the historical you know, considerations that is. Um, now you can recommend re re adaptive reuse of the building within the district compatible with the historical architectural aspects of the district. Well, that would be in an instance in which there's some other bot when you recommend, uh, that would be if there was a, a land use process in, a, in a, a planning and zoning commission reached out to you uh, if the council, uh, you know, was looking to, um, you know, support perhaps own land, acquire land, what have you, somebody within the town has some decision making related to adaptive reuse, they could look to you for some advice and, and whether or not you recommend it. So that's, you know, there's an instance where it's, it's a combination of exterior and interior, you're, you're going to be commenting on uh, reuse, repurposing of a building. You don't have the authority to say yes or no to whether or not they could use, but they can, uh, that other body could look to you for your guidance given your experience in, in uh, managing for consideration in the, uh, in the district. Oh, Ken, I, I have a quick question before you, um, yeah, in this section. Um, you know, it refers to the you know, they can consider the type and texture of building materials. And this, it, this reminds me of what, you know, we were just talking about colors of building materials. It doesn't say colors and um, it refers to type and texture. So you use the example of Chrome, which is sort of like a type, it's like a, mm -hmm. and a texture really. Um, but I'm thinking like color of say the window, um, you know, is that, I'm just concerned about, you know, opening the town to liability if someone, if, if they're, you know, they are looking at the colors of siding, which seems to me very similar to paint colors, but, you know, it, uh, but, but they're, they also might look at colors of materials, building materials. And is that, is that, I don't, would that be permitted? Because you gave the example of like a you know metal versus wood mm -hmm. you know but and that's you know different that, from that that, that is fair game there that absolutely that is fair game so the materials they're going to use um, is something and in, in the color of you know something that would be uh, garish that really doesn't fit in that's something that that because the stat this the the statute. It, if they intended to not allow consideration of color in every respect, they would have said so. And all they refer to is paint and exterior buildings. Um, you know, I raised and then I backed off a little bit. I mean, if your commission has had a history when somebody is going to put up siding, and there is, you know, you're, there's some give and take there because there's some ability you know, from for a historic district commission to say, I'm, we're not going to allow vinyl siding. We're going to allow, allow clapper or something like that. And if they you did that, you wouldn't be able to control the painting of, of, of the fabric. Uh, so the vinyl siding, you know, I, I could see that, I, there's not been a case on it. Uh, I can see that being defensible what the commission is doing because it's it's not, you, you're allowing an artificial material with a color on it. Uh, and you know that case hasn't come up yet. Um, whether a court's gonna say, well, that's really, the, 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 the exterior of the building is, is painted in the sense that that vinyl siding has color to it and the, the legislature intended that, um, I could see defending the commission and saying, well, it's not being painted um, and, and it specifically refers to paint. So um, you, 
I'm comfortable with the commission doing that with, with like vinyl siding, uh, exterior, the, the color of the building, the particular kind of building materials that are used and consideration, you know, that including could include um, the color of that because you're, that's not painting of the feature, the, co the color, the kind of wood that are going to be used, the kind of metal that's going to be used. I think that is something that, you know, you, the commission can't be arbitrary. There's got to be, if someone comes in with a whole bunch of evidence that shows that that this particular, you know, I'll use the silly example of chrome. I know there's, you know, chrome is not a major feature in your historic district, uh, but if just for the sake of argument, that it was all over, that that was, that was you know, the rage in Weathersfield in 1880, and that's been maintained all over the community. And somebody comes in and wishes to do that and put up the same kind of structure that is all over the, all over the district, the same kind of chrome, the same kind of design, and you say no to them, a court is likely to find that you know it's probably you're taking it out of somebody you don't like, as opposed to something that that's really related to the architectural, you know, the the the, the aesthetic considerations that that are rational. So all the evidence that's going to come before you, and we'll talk about that in a little while in the hearing, you you got to take that into account. So if you're you're mandating that somebody use a particular building material um, instead of the one they propose, and they come in with a boatload of evidence that this is what they're proposing is all over their neighborhood and then there's some risk uh but otherwise that in, in my view you know considering that you know the kind of materials which would include color wrought iron versus chrome that's something that that is within the commission's purview does that does that answer your question mary yes thank you sure and please, everybody else, I was just being awfully informal, um, but so rather than, than uh, Councilwoman uh, Pelletier, um, I called her Mary, so please call me Ken, and I don't think I offended her in, in doing that, but uh, Attorney Slater or Mr. Slater is not necessary. Uh, action uh, to prevent, this is enforcement. Um, what do you do if somebody has not, has not followed uh, what you were uh, what they're required to do. They've gone ahead and done construction, they've done demolition, they've, they've done things. The court can order them to, uh, to remedy their violation, including reconstruct something that's been, been demolished. Uh, and that's something, you know, courts have discretion. You can't force a court to do something. So, but if they violated this, this statute gives the court the power to enforce the statute and your ordinances. Uh, and require that any violation be correct, uh, corrected or removed. If somebody came in and, and, and put a structure uh, on top of their building without getting a certificate of appropriateness, um, you know, after the fact, they might come back to you uh, after you've or issued, you know, an order or an order has been issued by the, by the building official and come in and, and corrected the violation, claiming that they didn't realize they had to, uh, you know, that, that it happens. Sometimes people don't recognize or realize that they needed to do something. They can come back and get a fix. But you've got somebody who just cross, crosses their arms and, and refuses to come into compliance. You have to bring a civil action in the court, uh, and the court has the power uh, to to issue an injunctive order, the order that be corrected or restored. And it also has the ability of issuing a fine of not less than ten dollars to as much as $100 a day for every violation. And if it's willful, uh, not less than $100 or more than $250. Now, in the, there's a very similar scheme in zoning. And there was a case out of West Hartford that said that the non-willful violations are a civil violation and a willful violation is a criminal one. And you need to go to a criminal court. I've not seen any case involving historic district commissions that have gone to the criminal court as opposed to the civil court. So don't know whether or not uh, the, so, so ordinarily if I were to bring an enforcement case, um, I wouldn't open up the door for a, a um, an appeal if there's serious violations uh, of $100. If you added up $100 per day, uh, that's probably what I would seek against the court. The case law says it's the court's discretion. Uh, the court could decide, you know, under the circumstances there, even though they, ultimately there was a violation, I'm not going to issue a penalty. But they also can impose um, 
you know, all costs and expenses, including attorney's fees, can be assessed against the violator. Um, so there actually is a case where the court decided that they were not going to impose a fine, but they ordered uh, the violator to pay all the attorney's fees and costs. And funds that are collected, if you had to bring a suit like that, um, they, they then have to be used by your commission under, under this section here to restore um, any funds collected pursuant to the section to be used by the commission to restore the affected building structures or places to their condition prior to the violation wherever existed. And then the excess shall be paid to the municipality in which this district is situated. So if the court went so far as to order the, the violator take care of the entire problem and issued a fine of X dollars, in, those, in that circumstance, then the money would go to, to the town uh, in an instance in which uh, you know, the court gave the, made the fine in, intended the fine to be able to be used to restore the problem, then it, that would go to uh, that would go to you and and you, you know, engage contractors, etc., in order to fix the violation. Um, and persons who are aggrieved by you know your decision, if you issued one, have a period of time, 15 days uh, from when. The decision was rendered, but they, they have to have notice of that. There was a case in which notice wasn't immediately provided, so that gave them a little more time. Uh, but they have to bring an action to the superior court. There's no local body that, that provides any oversight over you. And then the same procedure, this section 8.8, that's the procedure for zoning appeals. Um, that's the process in which the, pro the appeal would be preceded. All the information that comes before your commission, that would go to the court. And the court wouldn't make its own decision. The court looks at the evidence and decides whether or not you had a, a, a legitimate basis, both legally and factually, to make your decision. And otherwise, it won't interfere with your decision. Um, and so then there's, uh, there's certain ex exempted acts and delays in demoli demolition. Um, so this does not prevent, and you, you have some guidance on your web page to people of what is ordinary maintenance or repair of exterior features, um, it, which does not involve a change in the appearance or design, nor prevent the erection or alter, alteration of such facility or feature, which the building inspector or similar agent certifies is required by public safety because of the condition, um, or which is unsafe or, or dangerous. So there's some, some things that are an exception to the rule. Um, and then under demolition, if a building in an historic district is demolished, no demolition shall occur for 90 days from the issuance of a demolition permit so that the historic district commission and the state can look at whether or not uh, there is uh, the ability to find a purchaser who will retain or remove such uh, building uh, or will present some other alternative to demolition. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a it's a, a cool down time, so to speak, to, to see if there's other opportunities in order to be able to save the building. Um, and uh, so, and I think, uh, yeah, that's that's the part of the statute I wanted to go over. So from that, I want I was uh, going to jump into the running meeting. So before I, I jump into that, um, is there anything about the overview of the statutes, the powers that you have uh, that you want me to touch? On? Yeah, one question I have, uh, you mentioned when you were talking about uh, majority of members voting yay or nay, uh, one thing that you mentioned, and I hope it's um, that you misspoke, was that if you only get, if you have a quorum of three and no other members there, and you have two out of three members voting yay, you said that it's a, it would become a denial. I assume that that is just a failure of that motion and another motion can be made. Oh, sure. Another motion can be made, but until you, you. unless you get it, unless you get um, in, 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 in it, if you were planning a zoning commission and you didn't have a special rule and you had a vote of two to one on a five member commission, that would be an approval. Yeah. In, in your instance, because you have to have a majority of the members, not a majority yeah. of 
quorum, you need the three. So if it fails, that doesn't mean another motion, another modification, something else wouldn't be approved, but you're going to need three people, three members of your commission in order to move business to approve a certificate of appropriateness. Is that different than your understanding? That's exactly what my understanding was. I just, what you said sort of confused me a bit and I just was hoping for a little clarification. I got that, thank you. Good, all right. I'm not, not the first time I've confused people. It won't be the last. <laughs> so I'm gonna switch gears here if you can bear with me a second. And I have to. <coughs> I'm trying to maximize my screen so I can stop sharing. And, uh, I use Microsoft Teams a lot more because that's what the courts use and I am who gave me permission to be able I'm thinking maybe oh there we go <laughs> I'm using multiple screens so it was on a different screen altogether okay did it um, so what I'm going to switch over to is is running meetings a kind of a tie to uh, FOI as well um, and let me start the show first And let's see if that works. What do you see? Like a PowerPoint. <laughs> Good. This, can you? Is it just a slide, or do you see? Um, you see the whole presentation. You can see. Where okay. I number of pages. Yeah, slides on the side. Yep. You see all that? Okay. Um, bear with me then again. And I'm just gonna I've got it shown on a different screen. So let's see if I can get it work right. Much How about better. Hey, okay. There we hey, go. Yeah, doctor. Can, uh, better now, better now. Um, so the I gotta see if it'll move for me. There we go. All right, so one of the critical parts of, of running a meeting and, and general parliamentary procedure is the importance of the, chair, the chairperson. Uh, and the, the, for small bodies, sometimes get, people get tangled up with, with, with parliamentary procedure and Robert's rules. One of the most important pages in Robert's rules uh, that, that small bodies, which are virtually every, you know, every commission for every town uh, in, in Connecticut is an exception that the rules are really designed for larger bodies, like Congress, like the General Assembly, like a town meeting when you have hundreds of people in the room. Uh, they're relaxed for smaller bodies. For example, Robert's Rule specifically says you don't even need a second on a motion when you're with a small body. Most commissions, uh, smaller commissions, still do seconds on their motion. But that's just an example right out of Robert's rules uh, where it's really, the rules are intended to be able to facilitate business. And as long as uh, business is being moved, motions are clear, people know what they're voting on, that's really the bread and butter of a meeting. Uh, the chairman needs to be able to keep, you know, business on track and, and during hearings, for example, I mean, when you're dealing with the public, you provide some latitude. There's no question people don't stay right on on, um, on theme and may not have a, a, a lot 
a lot of knowledge on this very specific consideration you're going to take into account uh, for a historical feature uh, on a building, and you'll provide some latitude. But CARE also has the ability to say, you know, that really isn't what we're trying to do tonight. You know, somebody comes in and talks about how they can't stand, you know, a particular business and they're, they're terrible, you know, for uh, for the community. Well, that's not what's really before you. So the, the chair has the ability to control that. Uh, the chair takes a position, a procedural one that you disagree with. If somebody can appeal that ruling and the whole body can decide on, on a procedural uh, a procedural decision. But that that's rare uh, and, and it's important that the, that the chair do that. Uh, and also I'll talk a little more about, about public hearings, but setting the stage for people to understand what the purpose of the public hearing is. Um, so when, when they provide that. Uh, now, I, I heard from the very beginning of this meeting, your commission tends to get pub, put public comment on their agenda, if I, if I heard that correctly. Um, and that's the, the same thing. You're letting you know, people be heard. Uh, they really should be, be talking to you about things that have things to do with your purview. And if it's something totally unrelated, some instances you'd be polite and you listen and then move on to the next person, but you certainly have the authority uh, to point the person in the other in, in another direction and, and call them out of order, frankly, for talking about things that are completely unrelated. Uh, talk a little bit more about you know clarity of, of motions. That's really um, critical, especially if you have a complex one that, that you if you were going to include, let's say it was going to be a denial with, with guidance. Um, you know, carefully working out exactly what you are uh, advising the uh, the applicant that you're going to deny this certificate of appropriateness. If you're going to provide guidelines to them, you know, being clear on, on what those are is important. Uh, now, what's a meeting? This is FOI. Uh, so, the in a hearing is always a meeting that has to be open to the public. That doesn't mean the public um, it, it, the public has the ability to be heard during a public hearing on things that are relevant, as I mentioned before. Um, a quorum of a multi-member public agency, that doesn't apply to you, but it is from the FOI. Uh, a communication or between a quorum of members. This it can be a, a real challenge in the modern world because often commission members are receiving agenda, receiving packages and material by email. And sometimes it's a challenge not when they see something like, this doesn't look like you receive it. This isn't, this isn't compliant. This person didn't submit X, Y, or Z. If you start having that dialogue on an email chain or any other elect, uh, electronic communication, it's a meeting. You're, you've got the quorum of the members are seeing the email chain uh, and there's something substantive being set. So the only thing that should be happening over the, uh, over the email are, uh, you know, passing on information, communication about, you know, be, whether or not somebody asks a question, can people attend and they're responding. You're not deliberating on any kind of business. You're just conducting the business of scheduling a meeting. Uh, but you have to refrain as much as you want. To, you'd want to comment, refrain from having any dialogue uh, over an email chain uh, regarding substance of the commission's business. You've got to wait till the meeting is called. Um, and this is uh, ability, obviously, in the world of, of uh, the pandemic, we're doing this meeting right now completely virtually. Even before uh, that existed, there is the ability under FOI, one, the one agency that more often than any other I've participated with where they have people participating by phone is the Freedom of Information Commission. Uh, so that it is possible uh, when you have hearings People need to be able to, and especially for a historic district commission, visual, visual evidence is obviously critical. And so if you're only on the phone and you've not seen any of those things during a hearing, well, you, you shouldn't be voting on them that night. Um, now, if you've given the package and people are talking about it and you have it in front of you and you can follow it, then that's fine. Uh, but if they're presenting brand new stuff uh, during a hearing and they, they're presenting it, presenting photographs, presenting whatever it is, and you don't have the ability to see it, there's really uh, two choices. You don't participate in the vote, um, or you know, the, the commission keeps, you know, defers decision to a subsequent meeting, 
at which point you can be provided with whatever visual information was provided. But ideal, like you are tonight, you'd be participating um, and be able to see the information. Ken, I have a couple, a couple questions on that. We've been trying to deal with that. Um, Kim sends out our agenda package by having her add to the email every time, please don't reply to all. And that way, if, for instance, I look at something and I see there's something missing from the pack um, that we need that the applicant hasn't included, I will send a, one single email to her and other members will do that. And we assume that that is fine. That is fine. And then um, the other issue that your comments brought up for me is we've been having trouble lately with people not getting the information to Kim in advance of the hearing. And so then there, our procedure is you get your packet the week before, you drive around, you look at the properties in person, you have your written material as well available to you. So you have two different, you know, you, you really should be looking at it in person in addition to the packet. But then at the meeting, we have the contractors mostly not submitting everything they need to submit and bringing extra photos, which they then want to share on the screen. Normally in person, if you if we were we're pretty lenient about if you bring it in and everybody can see it at the hearing and we've got it in our hands, we can include it in the record, but we can't include it in the record when it's just being shown to us on the screen. So we've been holding people over lately for that. Is that the appropriate way to handle that? That's fine. That's fine. Now, now, you know, if someone has submitted something on the screen and you all are really comfortable because it's very simple um, and you haven't done it in advance, you, that person, you can have that person, you know, first of all, the meetings, you know, it's recorded like this one is, uh, but you could have the person submit the information that was submitted that night, to put it in the record. So there can be an exception to that rule if something is, is so rudimentary that you don't need to push them off. But your practice of, of doing that because you haven't had an opportunity to have it in advance, it's not fully part of the record. Um, and in fairness, you should probably have an opportunity to study it more carefully than you might be able to when it shows up okay. on the first time. Yes, that practice that you're doing is appropriate. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so what's not a meeting? Again, this is FOI, a caucus. Uh, you are seeing a group of members of a, of a single party could, um, it's caucuses are not the, all that common on historic district commissions or land use boards, uh, but it doesn't, it's not a meeting as long as you're all from the same party. Um, on administrative staff of a single member agency, again, that's something out of FOI that doesn't apply to you. Uh, these communications regarding notice of meetings of the agendas. You asked me the question about don't reply to all. There is an instance, and I know this is not what you're doing. I'm confident what you're doing are communications regarding notice of meetings or their agendas. You might see something that's missing. You you email the, 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 the one person to say that, you know, is, is this missing or I don't have page four or I can't see. That kind of communication is fine. I'll be facetious a little bit, but if you had somebody say, please don't reply to all, but please reply to me to confirm whether you believe that uh, the building materials proposed in application XYZ are appropriate, and you all replied only to the one person, right. That's, that would be a meeting. You, 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 even though not everybody sees how you're voting, you are all communicating on a, on a piece of business, even though you're filtering it through one person. You'd effectively be making a substantive decision outside of the view of the public. That's what FOI is all about. So FOI understands that you know trying to just communicate about what's on an agenda, the, your meeting package, materials that are there. Uh, I think quite commonly a chairperson is going to communicate with staff that sees something's missing and might want to have staff reach out to the applicant and say, by the way, you're missing X, Y, and Z. So I think there's a typically a, a special relationship between a, a, between a chair and staff on and things like that. Uh, but any any substantive communication, you wouldn't be able to get around substantive decision simply by re replying to, to, uh, to the one person. But just things like move, you know, scheduling and the like, you can. Um, you know, if you are, if, if you go to another commission's meeting, if you go into a plan that you all decide there's an important matter before the planning and zoning commission, or there's an important matter before the council, and you all go, and every single one of you are there, that's not a meeting, because you are there attending 
another agency's meeting. Now there's a, the, the, the Freedom of Information Commission had been taking the position, uh, which was relatively recently reversed by the Supreme Court, that groups, um, it, it would typically come in context of, of site visits where commissions would say, all right, as long as there's less than a quorum, um, you mm -hmm. don't have to schedule it as a public, public meeting, just go out and view the property. So two, you know, in, in, in your instance, it would be two at a time would avoid quorum. Uh, and there was an FOI decision that said that, no, you can't get around that site visit is really part of the proceeding um, and you can't avoid it by, by doing that. Well, a case came out, which was a full quorum was present. The leadership, I, be I believe it was Meredith, but the leadership of the uh, council was meeting to work on a resolution with an outgoing town manager. And they were trying to select a new town manager. And so give, between the leaders of both parties, mm -hmm. they actually had a quorum of the council that were meeting with the outgoing town manager working up a resolution. So based on typical, you know, the FOI decision-making up to that point in time, that was a, an illegal meeting. They should have noticed it. And the Supreme Court said it was not, that they were not actually holding a hearing. They didn't have any power. They couldn't decide anything. They were just working on something that was ultimately going to be presented during an open meeting. Had they been charged to be, if you have a committee that's charged with going out and gathering information, well, that committee would be holding a meeting. If part of your hearing process, it wouldn't apply to an HDC, but if you, you had uh, you know, an information gathering body that you wanted to do, maybe you wanted to do some, possibly consider making some, some changes uh, and you set up a specific committee to do that. Well, if that committee had, a, had a, a, a job to do and was going to be required to make a report back to the full commission, uh, then that would be a meeting. But if, if even a quorum of you got together to talk about uh, now, I don't recommend it um, to, you know, certainly pending business, you shouldn't get together and be talking about what you're going to do on an on a application that, that's coming. Uh, but I'll just let you know that the, the Supreme Court re relaxed to some degree instances in which persons who would otherwise constitute a quorum, um, and we're, we're talking about business, uh, you know, you, you're sitting down to talk about maybe you're going to make a proposal to modify rules of procedure for, for your group. Um, a quorum, based on that Supreme Court decision, could meet and it not be, not be a meeting. You definitely shouldn't do that with a pending application because there's other implications that I'll get to, which is ex parte evidence, bias, and things of that nature. Um, we, we, in the past, we would, while well, I'm getting a lot of echo, in the past, we would do site visits as a group mm -hmm. when there was a big project, and we've moved away from that um, due to the uncertainty as to whether we should be doing that, you know, hanging around on someone's property with the homeowner, looking at what they're, you know, they've staked out and getting a view of the land up close. What's your thought about it if we're there to see the stakes and where the project's going to be as a group? Um, but we're not really discussing it until the hearing. Should that be done individually, or can we? Do you think under this new, more relaxed rule, we can can go as one group, and then just no, if you were going to go with a in that context, I would say that 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 site visit is really part and parcel of of the application consideration. So if less than a quorum went out, um, I think the new Supreme Court rule would protect you from having to, to, to have it as a public meeting. But I will say it's, I think most commissions that hold site visits have moved more towards just noticing it as a meeting and meeting as a group. Um, and so they see the same thing and hear the same thing at the same time. But I think you could do it either way. Okay. But if you are going to meet as a quorum, you should notice it as a as, you know, special meeting um, so that you know, people are aware that, that that's what you're doing. And you should, like you had, advise people not to talk other than, you know, you might have questions of the applicant to confirm, does that stake mean what that stake means? Uh, and then, you know, you put that, you know, on the, uh, 
keep that in, in a minute or, uh, uh, or, or present it during the course of the, of the hearing. So when can the public be excluded? Um, and it's litigate, um, I jumped past that, executive sessions. Uh, and when you have an executive session, it's limited to members of the commission and people you invite, but you have to state on in the minutes who's been in attendance. So uh, if you were to invite me, for example, if there was an appeal um, and there was a proposal to resolve an appeal, um, you would typically be inviting you know, the town attorney or whoever represented you in that matter, and you'd be able to go into executive session and discuss that. So the two main, there's a whole list of things for executive session, but the two that I think could apply to you, the first would be pending claims and litigation. And by the way, if it pending doesn't mean it's really pending. That's what it, the statute says. But if there was a violation and you wanted to talk amongst yourselves of whether or not a civil action should be brought or recommended uh, to be brought, you could go into executive session for that. It's not just existing litigation. Uh, so that's something you can do. And the other one is if you got if you got per, if you got um, privileged communication or communications that are otherwise wouldn't be subject to disclosure. And, and really the only thing I could think of in your instance uh, would be a, uh, a town attorney's opinion. If there were often town attorney's opinions to a historic district commission or a land use body or the council are things that are actually gonna be disclosed because the public's gonna be notified about you know, what, whatever the topic is. That's why you're asking for the town attorney's opinion and it would be disclosed to the public. But there could be instances where an agency or the council are looking for a legal opinion that they want to be between them and their council. And you're entitled to that, just like a person's entitled to, to advice of counsel. In which case, the only way that that can be protected if you wanted to go over that document would be to go over it in executive session. So it, you couldn't just invite the town attorney into executive session to just talk about anything. The only thing you just invite the town attorney to talk to you about are pending claims of litigation or attorney-client privilege communication. But if there was, um, I, I'm just you know, thinking out loud here, I mean, there are some provisions regarding security. Um, so if there, were, you know, if there was a, a school or a public building within your district and there were special security requirements that somehow played a role in terms of, of something that was coming before your commission, uh, there is a possibility to go in executive session to protect uh, disclosure of things that relate to public security. But I've never heard of something like that coming before an, an HDC, so I doubt it would, uh, would come before you, but that, that does exist. So public hearings, the role of, of your role in a public hearing. Uh, you evaluate the evidence that's been presented. Uh, you are, you know, I say you're like a jury. You evaluate the credibility of witnesses. Now you are unique, and I'm going to talk about this next one. Commission must defer to expert testimony on issues of technical nature that are beyond your expertise. Well, historic district commissions often include people that have expertise in subject matter that's coming before the district. If you do, you should put that information, disclose that during the hearing. Uh, you know, the applicant is entitled to a fundamentally fair hearing and, you know, very technical term, they shouldn't get sandbagged. And so that if you as a member have this very specific information that you would want the rest of the commission to know, and it comes from your own expertise, and you hold off until deliberations to plop down, you know, an article, a photograph, whatever it might be, and you've never given the applicant the opportunity to comment on that. Maybe the maybe the applicant has an expert, and you have expertise, and you put something on the table, and their expert says, "I think you, I think you misread that." Um, to give you the ability to at least be heard on it, you might not ultimately dis might not ultimately agree with the applicant but at least the applicants had an opportunity to hear from it. So if there are, if you know, as you hear an application come before you, that there's some substantive information uh, that you have, not just experience to evaluate, if it's experience to evaluate the information that's being submitted, 
that's different. But if you're going to bring to the deliberations, oh, by the way, I know this about this topic, here's a report, or here's my specific knowledge that I want you other members of the commission to rely on to deny this application, that can be problematic. So if you have it, you should share it during the course of the hearing so that it can be fully aired by everyone. Um, we already talked about you know, the, the ordinary sequence. Historic district commissions are usually you know, different than a, a typical contested land use application, but if you have a contested one, you know, ordinarily the sequence would be a presentation by the applicant, um, often followed by questions by the commission. Um, some commissions will wait to ask questions till the very end, but quite commonly, you know, the commission would ask questions after the applicant's presentation, followed by comments by the public during a public hearing. Some commissions will specifically call for, are there persons who are in favor, persons against, or persons that are neither for or against, but have information they want to present to the commission. Some do it that way, some just simply open you know, open the, the door for people to comment and people just do it, you know, as, you know, one at a time, perhaps one in favor, one against, one against, one against, one in favor, one in favor. Uh, that's really your prerogative. What's important is that people are given a reasonable opportunity to be heard. Um, if you had one that was really controversial, this again falls in the role of the chair. At the beginning of the hearing, we try to advise people not, they don't have to just repeat, um, you know, and get a a bunch of people, you know, you could get up and say, I agree for the reasons that, that uh, you know, Madam Smith presented um, and not reiterate the whole thing again. If you can encourage that, uh, that could help speed the process along. You can limit time frames, but um, you need to be able to give persons the ability to present. After everyone's had an opportunity to speak, that person should be given more time. Uh, the, if the applicant goes on with a presentation for an hour and 15 minutes and a ne next door neighbor who has a boatload of information that they want to present to you and you say you've got three minutes, that's not a fair process for that, that person. So, you know, one alternative when you know somebody shows up in a, you know, in a tie and, and is representing a group of people, usually the best judgment is to let that person speak for longer than three minutes because they're representing a bunch of people and they've come in with, a, you know, presumably a more substantive presentation. Uh, but if you wanted to, you could hold them to hold him or her to the three minutes. But at the end, after everyone's had an opportunity to speak, the person needs to be afforded an opportunity to present the rest of the information they wish, wish to. Cross-examination of witnesses, due process, not, not constitutional due process, but fundamentally fair due process, which is the test that applies to commissions, uh, is would allow for somebody to directly cross-examine a witness. It's unusual, and they have to ask for it. You can you can try to have all questions come through the chair, um, and set that as your ordinary policy. But if somebody comes in and says, "No, I, I, it's awkward for me to ask the questions through the through the chair. I want to ask this witness directly." Um, and as long as it's decorum, there's no personal attacks. Uh, they are, you know, they, they are ex exercising, again, reasonable decorum in, in the way they're behaving. They are able to or entitled to ask, to ask direct questions. I've not been involved in an HD process in which someone has done that, but I'll, I'll just tell you that if somebody demands it, you should allow them to within the parameters of, of decorum. We already talked about site walks, um, evidence, uh, you you, you know, you have a, a ringer as, as a chair in terms of, you know, what she does for a living. Um, and staff is very, very good in town as well. So I'm guessing it's not a problem of, of keeping documents organized, uh, numbered, keeping lists of them. Uh, if you get a demonstrative exhibit, if somebody comes in and presents a video or something like that, you need to get a copy of that. And that needs to be made part of the record. Because as I indicated before, if there's an appeal, the appeal, the court is going to see everything you saw. Uh, and so you need to be able to keep a, a good record to protect yourselves um, so that you, once the court looks at the information, they, they can, this, the court will decide that you had legitimate legal basis to take whatever action, whether it be an approval or a denial. Now, ex parte evidence is when you receive information outside of the confines of the public hearing. Uh, now, if somebody 
you should, I said before, you're like a jury. You're also like a judge. Um, you, you, a superior court judge or, you know, appellate or Supreme Court judge, you know, they are very practiced in not putting themselves in awkward positions. And people tend not to try to run up to them and say, you know, Your Honor, I want to tell you something about your case. Uh, they, you know, they will not allow somebody to, to start talking to them about that. You know, you, you might not be able to avoid it. You're, you know, at a local, you know, you're at the stop and shop or you're, you know, at a restaurant and somebody runs up to you and hands you something um, or tells you something that can't be unheard. Right? The only way that you can manage that, um, you, you, if you have somebody who starts to talk to you, the thing is stop them and say, please, I, I know you, what you have, I want to hear. I want you to tell me what information you have about this application, but you got to do it in a meeting. Everybody needs to be able to hear you. You can't share it with me. I wish we could talk about it now, but we can't. Uh, I'm a member of the commission. The commission has to decide, so please come to our meeting next month on the 15th. And that's the way you can, you should handle it with people. But if somebody hands you something and you've seen it, it's too late. So the way to handle that is provide the information at the hearing. Let the applicant know that you were approached, somebody, if, if you think it's relevant, if you're going to rely on it, um, then you should bring it, present it, and then allow the applicant to, to, to uh, have an opportunity to understand it. The famous case, the land use, not a historic district case, but that happened. Somebody gave somebody a picture of a well. One of the issues was its distance from, from a building. Gave them the thing. They didn't disclose it during the hearing. They went into deliberations and they, can, they handed member of the commission who got this from the public and never presented a public hearing, put it out on the table and the commission relied on it as a basis for denial. That denied the applicant a fair hearing uh, because, well, I think for obvious reasons. So, so the way to, that could have been avoided if the person said, look, I've got this map, and it, this is what it shows, put it on the record, the applicant then would be able to say, no, you're wrong, um, and this is why you're wrong, then it would have been a fundamentally uh, fair process. Uh, Post-hearing correspondence, this is really a staff thing, and, and I've had some that have been uncomfortable with this concept, but if there is a hearing after the public hearing is closed, somebody writes this letter that, that is advocating against or for a certificate of appropriateness, the hearing's closed. You can't consider any new evidence. So that, that letter, it's a public record because it's been submitted. It should be sequestered from you. Um, it should not be provided to you and it shouldn't be reviewed by you. And as long as it's, it's managed that way and someone, you know, if it ever you know, came to pass, uh, could do an affidavit or otherwise to say this information came in after the public hearing, it was put in a folder and it was not provided to the commission, then that would protect uh, the fair process. You can receive staff input uh, if there was a legal issue, for example, that came up after the public hearings closed. I could comment on uh, the legal question. I couldn't present new evidence, but as long as it's related to evidence that's been submitted, that's something that you can get comments on um, and that's perfectly permissible. Um, and so we already talked about quorum voting. If you miss part of a meeting, you can get up to speed, review, you know, now in this world, you should be able to, to get a recording and, and view it as if you were here. Uh, but it's also listening to tapes back when, you know, when, when meetings were just in person uh, and weren't videotaped, listening to the tapes, and even cases that say if you looked at good, good notes um, or good minutes that gave detail, you were able to look at the plans, then you can be qualified to vote. Um, a, a tie vote um, is if you had, you know, four, four members, your commission is easy because you need, you need a majority of the members. But on commissions, if you only needed two votes and it was a uh, two to two vote for another kind of commission, not yours, that would be a denial. Uh, but in your case, you know, there can never be an instance where a, a tie vote uh, would be an approval. Uh, commissioner participation, ground, conflicts of interest. I mean, I'll, I'll just boil it down to a couple of things. I mean, there's, there's bias uh, if you've expressed you know, a classic example in, in that, that's used in the training that, that I've done was with, you know, you're a wetland commission and you believe that, uh, uh, that 
you know, the Wethersfield Cove is a, a critical resource for uh, waterfowl habitat, habitat. And you say very publicly, I am not gonna allow any change in Wethersfield Cove because of, I, it needs to be protected for that purpose. Well, that's obviously prejudgment. Somebody comes in, they're not even given that wetlands applicant an opportunity to say, this is what I'm doing to protect that. Now, if that same person said, this is a very important resource, um, and you're going to have to demonstrate to me that you are not going to adversely affect it. Well, that shows the person's sincere concern, but not a closed-mindedness. So in that instance, it would not be uh, be biased. So the same thing can go into in, your uh, nomenclature. Yep. So, so if you are saying things that you would never consider this or the other thing, that you run the risk of bias, but you can certainly share an opinion about how important certain considerations are and allow the applicant to try to persuade you uh, that you should be approved and that should avoid uh, a claim of bias. Um, you know, extracurricular, again, ex parte, not only being provided uh, information, but if you if you are not acting like a neutral decision maker uh, and you're doing, it, there, there's a balance here. You are, you, you can provide, do some research and provide some information and put it on the record. But if you become so zealous, there's actually, it is a historic district case in the out of Litchfield where a member of a commission, you know, actually recused, um, I think it was herself, and then stated that uh, she was an expert in the area and was a vociferous opponent to this particular application. And the courts decided that it, it was not, the applicant was denied a fair process because this person who had you know, recused himself then goes on and, and claims they're an expert and presents all this information that, that was persuasive. They said that that wasn't that wasn't fair. So if you go so far that the research that you're doing suggests that you really had it out against this applicant and application, you, you're running a risk. Uh, but if you're sharing information you think is important and you put it on the record, it, it's really a common sense test. Um, you should be fine. Okay, Ken, quick question. Yes. Uh, if I come out and state that I will never approve any vinyl siding on an 18th century house, is that a closed-minded point of view? Well, you'd be better. I mean, if you'd be better, you'd be better off not saying it that that broadly. Exactly, I think my but... example, I think my example about a wetlands commission is a little different than a historic district commission. Mm -hmm. If it's clear in a particular historic district that there is something that just is incongruent with the district, and there's no reason why. The pub, the, you know, members of people within the district don't understand that. So you know, your commission is probably one where you could come out and, and, and in the context, it's still better in the context of an application to let them know that this particular, I'll go back to Chrome, that, that Chrome is not, import, is not appropriate to be yes. on fencing material. You just say that, then that's fine. That's different than, than than the situation I described with the wetlands application, because it is possible that a person could, could do a development in a, you know, the Weathersfield Cove that would address the person's concern about it being a resource for waterfowl or whatever the example it might be. But if there really is no way you can use chrome, it's going to fit in. Yeah, to ju just to jump in on a basic yeah. statement, if he didn't say an 1880s house, he just said vinyl siding in the district anywhere. You know, we have a house built in 1960. Yeah. I mean, that, that's more a trouble. State. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so that's where you're bringing, you're helping me here because you know your district. And yeah, you we, we would that. probably hear that more frequently than, as you're saying, you, you should understand that a home of that era would not be appropriate right. out the and, gate. And, and that's what your, 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 your district is not as homogenous as some is right. some uh, historic district that dealt with. You've got areas where the character is very different than others. Um, so I can see in, in a very small district um, where the, all the homes are very similar, the buildings are very similar, that someone might come out and say that, that that's not appropriate generally. 
but you might get in trouble when you're dealing with a, a district that, that has some variance uh, and you're just gonna say, I'm never gonna approve it. And then like I gave my example before, there's a hundred houses next to one another all have vinyl siding and you've come out and said, I'm never gonna approve vinyl siding anywhere in the district. Uh, then I, that would be problematic when you got to another area. So, so you've picked up a nuance in that. that, that I'm, I'm I can't that. believe none of you have brought up above ground pools. <laughs> we're, we're giving you a pass. <laughs> <laughs> that was next. That's for, yeah. that's for me, man. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Well, I'll let you, I'll let you with the inside joke. Uh, and so, um, yeah, this is there. You can represent your own interest. I mean, just because you've been a member of this commission, if someone's doing something next door to your house, um, you can. You have to recuse yourself, obviously, uh, but you can appear in, in, on your own behalf and make it clear that in, on your own behalf, um, you are taking a position with respect to it. And now, you can never represent someone else um, in front of uh, your commission. And if you have a conflict, if you have a personal or financial interest in the application, um, the best practice is to not even be in the room. Uh, there have been some cases where, you know, people are saying, well, the, the person's sitting there and they're nodding and they're, they're influencing people, even though they're not sitting at the table. So you avoid any of that in the, in, in the wonderful worlds of text and email. You can leave the meeting and you can be notified that that particular item of business has been passed and you join the meeting again. That's the safest way to approve something. And it, it's, it's, it's valor, not uh, shame to come out and, and disclose that you have a conflict. You believe that, in, and it's not just um, an actual conflict, which is one I'm touching in here. So financial interest includes your interest or include members of your family or a business uh, that you're associated with. Uh, a personal interest is close friendships or other association with the applicant. Only each individual has the discretion to make this decision. The commission can't say, are you kidding me? Of course you have a conflict. You can't sit on this application. You could suggest that they might want to consider it. This is something you know that when you have somebody that you've been working with on the commission and you get the sense that they're going to participate in something that you know involves their you know their sister, um, that you tap him or her on the shoulder and say, you need to recuse yourself. But if ultimately the person refuses, it's their call and it's just subject to exposure of the, of the town to a successful appeal. Uh, but you, you make the judgment, not just on whether or not you really believe it's going to influence your ability to be fair, because it might be your best friend from, you know, from kindergarten and you know, you're going to be tougher on, on her than you would be on any other applicant. So you know you're gonna be fair. Well, the public's not gonna think that. So if it would appear to the public that you're not in a position to, to, to fairly decide the issue, then you should recuse yourself. Uh, and you should ideally state the reason why. So there's no, you know, no mystery to it. I recuse myself and walk out the door and no one has a clue why. Perfectly appropriate to acknowledge it's a friend of mine, or this is you know, related to business or what have you. Um, so I already touched on that. Um, touched on bias. The, the atmosphere of, of hostility, I mean, sometimes, you know, there's actually a case where people were making, you know, it goes back some decades. So I don't know how well it would hold up as well now, but sometimes all the commissioner, chairman, all the court's gonna get is a transcript but they were actually saying a bunch of Italian jokes. And you know what, from reading the transcript, if you were in the room, you might've believed that it was all in, in, in good, you know, good fun and no one was or should have been offended. Uh, but there was a determination that it created a situation of hostility. So if there is, you know, and it does not have to always be race, gender, ethnicity, uh, it could be you know, something personal regarding a particular applicant you've had issues with. Uh, you know, avoid you know, saying things, just use a common sense approach, saying things that might, you know, once an appeal is said in the, and the words that were spoken, see the light of day that a court looks at, if somebody would look at that and raise their eyebrow about, is this really a fair process? 
Uh, you want to avoid that. Um, I already talked about that. I guess that's that's the uh, the end of my overview of, uh, of how you run a effective meetings and some of the considerations for for conflicts of interest. So, are there topics? Are there things that uh, you hoped or expected I was going to cover that I that I've missed, or do you have any questions that I can either try to answer or get back to them? Quick question. question. Uh, Jen, yeah, it's on. Uh, it's becoming a big function of Kim's job. Can you address notice that we're supposed to provide what our legal responsibilities are to uh, the public? Uh, and maybe Kim can tell you what we do right now. Yeah, why don't you do that? And then I can actually, when I, if I get rid of this, I can pull up, I, I jumped over uh, that section of notice, but I could actually pull it up. So if we can, we can multitask here, what do you do now? It is Kim. Well, technically, oh, yeah. Yeah. could you go through it, Kim, for us? It's, so, a, it's a lot of hours. Cost. Oh, for a butters, you mean? Yes. Yes. Oh, God. The whole, the whole process. And then Ken can tell us what we're supposed to do. Okay. So, right now, I thought you meant the legal notice. You didn't like reading oh, the, legal oh, the whole process. <laughs> yeah. Um, Okay, so I do the legal notice. Um, I am as specific as possible. Um, I was told that the more detail, the better. Um, and then the next, in the next few days, I notify the abutters within 300 feet by sending out copies of the legal notice to each residents within 300 feet so that can be I have in the summer it can be 360 letters that go out um and I have constantly been in question constantly constantly been questioning um that zoning does um, not do their own. They send it out to the applicant to have them notify um, of their own application. And then they put out a sign and it's not the responsibility of the other commissions. It only seems to be historic um, where it falls on the town employee to do that. I think, Ken, we, it happens on controversial pro um, projects for us where people will say that they didn't know, neighbors will say they didn't know it was happening. And of course, you know, it's in the newspaper. I think it's, I think only in the Rare Reminder in the current right now, is that what we're doing, Kim? Not the current, um, it's only the Rare Reminder. It's posted in at the town hall, it's posted on the town website, and then the abutters find out. And so the abutters, obviously, if you're in a spot where the houses aren't really close, you're not, and the, I think the key example of that is the project on the corner of Maple and Middletown Avenue. Um, you know, people down further Middletown Avenue, eventually they all did here, but it's something that we face all the time. I'm wondering if you're seeing a trend at all um, with other boards and commissions across the state to do um, more notification online sort of thing. We had someone come in and say, I don't understand why you're not notifying people by email, which would be incredibly burdensome for our town employee that has 15 hours a week to get this job done. Um, but I'm just curious as to what you see in other districts, because I think we do a pretty good job of letting- You do way more than what's legally required. Um, what's legally required is for an application, and I'll read this uh, verbatim, uh, the historic, no, let me let me back up. The I haven't seen your I've seen your handbook. I don't know whether you've adopted formal law in the form in the form of an ordinance regarding notice. I, that was something I didn't look at to prepare for tonight. So, so you might have adopted something that has the force of law that you ha have to do, or you might be just doing it by practice. But but this is what your commission would have to do. So you could change the rules if you wish to, but all you need to do is fix a reasonable time and placement of hearing 
and notice of the time and place of such hearing shall be given by publication in the form of a legal advertisement appearing in a newspaper having substantial circulation, not more than 15 or less than five days before a hearing. And that's it. Yeah, so we, you, the rare reminder obviously is delivered for free to every house. And so that mm -hmm. is the obvious choice, but it is online and it is posted at town hall as well. And we do notify a reasonable number of abutters and we, we pay for that. We bear the cost of that. We don't have a sign out front like other commissions do. Um, but I think, you know, we, the complaints for me, if you're concerned about your neighborhood, then you're keeping an eye on what's going on by looking at the town website or something, you know, to that effect. So I don't, I think we're doing a pretty good job of it, but we do have complaints whenever there's a controversial application. Any abutter notice is more than you're required to, to, to do. And if you were going to adopt, um, you know, the abutter notice in, in both historic district commissions and land use commissions, it's something that can get adopted by the commission as a requirement. And you could make that a requirement of the applicant um, if you if you wish to. That's something that you could include in your policies, policies and procedures. But you know, to some to the extent that you get criticized, you know, you are obligated to do no more than, you know, and I'm not saying to be arrogant and tell somebody you're not entitled to any notice other than the newspaper notice, but that is that is the right answer. The state statute only requires that public notice be given in the form of a, a legal advertising. And the web page is always should always be a backstop as well. Um, you should, now in the in the in the modern era, especially from what's happened during COVID, when everybody's gotten so accustomed to looking for agenda and looking for uh, you know minutes and, and notices, et cetera, to, to use your web page, which you're doing. So uh, you're yeah, ours is practice. we're by practice only, not by any additional rules that we've passed. Okay. And if you ever wanted to, to pass it on and, and give that that burden to an applicant, you could do it. I had another question too, Jen. Sorry, can you mentioned that in a couple instances that if a hundred houses on the street had vinyl siding, what precedence does that set? Because we always say each house stands alone. Could, did you mean well, how, how did you mean that? There's no precedence in the sense of like a court of law has to follow what somebody else did. So what would happen if someone was going to take an appeal, they're going to have to, you know, when you look at the, the considerations, you're trying to protect the, the, the historic nature of, of the district. Well, you know, there in, in your district, there's, there, there's very different kinds of, of um, historical features in one area versus another. If I came in and I wanted to do exactly the same thing as my neighbor, my neighbor's neighbor and everybody else, um, and you made me turn my house into something, you know, although it might be beautiful, it has no bearing whatsoever to what is going on in that particular neighborhood that all the houses were constructed in 1958 um, and they were all of, of this particular kind of character and you just said to this person I don't care I want you to do something completely out of character with everything else you run a risk that that decision was art was arbitrary you're not obligated because other people have done people might have done some things before the, the historic district was formed in, I think, 1962. So there, there might be some, some properties that really didn't uh, adhere to, to what they should have if they cared about trying to, to deal with historic you know, nature of, of that particular area. Um, so there might be some outliers. But if literally everybody had exactly the same thing and this person wanted to come in and you decided well, let's start with this woman and we're going to make her put this kind of clabbered and this kind of shingles and this and that that had no bearing whatsoever to anything else. I think you'd have a risk of, of being of having that decision overturned as being arbitrary. So there's no specific precedent um, and nobody could say because you did this for Mrs. Jones, you have to do it for me on the one hand. On the other hand, when that whole pile of evidence comes down and the judge has to decide 
whether you had a legal substantial evidentiary basis to conclude when you looked at those factors that I read before to determine that that, that it wasn't uh, a similar you know type of material texture what have you when all the evidence shows that they have exactly the same kind of materials and textures as everybody else has in that area, you'd have a problem. So no, there's no precedent on the one hand. On the other hand, again, to the common sense test, um, when, you know, when, when there's a lot of evidence that, that, you, that everything is a particular style, a particular architecture, particular whatever, and you're making an example out of one, there's some risk. And, and, and that's assuming that those other the butters uh, with similar style uh, received approval. Is that accurate statement as well too, or does that no, change no, a little not bit? Necessarily still... because you, no, you've established, you know, when it was established, it was a recognized historical character of, you know, the area with- This the is district. post 62, let's say, and, and after- So these are, okay. Yeah. So there are actual approvals- Either ignorance or no knowledge of, and they changed a feature. And, yeah. and someone is citing that feature. Uh, yeah, and, and so, oh, you explained it well, though. Thank you. OK, yeah, it's probably really what, black and white, right? Yeah, yeah, I think what he's getting at is what we face a lot is we have people who do work on their homes without approval. And then we're in the position, are we going to chase down every person who's changed a window in the middle of the night to avoid us um, and, you know, launching into our enforcement powers and, you know, how do we, our usual drill right now is to have Kim send a letter and ask them to come in and see us. But sometimes things, you know, we've got 1200 properties in the district. Sometimes we don't catch it. And maybe years later, it's brought to our attention. Now it's a new homeowner. And can we, what can we do in that situation? But those are the things that are used as examples against us, I would say, at hearings. Um, you know, well, our neighbors have that door. Well, you know, we didn't know your neighbor had that door because they didn't ask for our approval for it right. first. And that's exactly an appropriate approach. And in terms of enforcement, I mean, you know, an example is when you're driving, you know, you're driving up to Mount 91 and the police officer sitting there and 75 people are driving 90 miles an hour and the 76th get pulled over. Um, you know, that's no, you know, that's no, defense that all the other people were, were speeding and they get pulled over. And you have limited resources, limited enforcement tools, and there's going to be some instances where something's going to be disclosed to you. And it's just not, you know, it, it, not that it's not important to follow your rules, but you've just identified how many properties you have in your district and you need to focus your attention on the things that are most important to protecting the district. So you have a lot of discretion and when you're going to uh, pull the trigger, so to speak, on, on enforcement. And, uh, and so on the one hand, permitting, telling, having somebody point to you doing, somebody has, having done something illegally, that's really hard precedent uh, for somebody to that, say that they should be able to do something so it sounds like you've been doing it on the money. Kim has her hand up. I do. I have um, along the same lines with enforcement. Um, so I sent out letters that have been go out certified mail and they've been completely ignored and it goes on and on. And there have been cases that we've, um, it, one in particular that has gone on and on and on for 30 plus years and nothing's ever done, um, how do I head those off and, and deal with them in a timely manner um, when they're being ignored? Well, one, I'm not, this, is, this, this little piece of advice isn't gonna solve a, pro, you know, a problem that's been you know, festering for 30 years, but um, I hate certified mail. Um, and because the people who aren't following the rules don't like to open up envelopes that say certified mail. So one piece of advice is to send any, any, inf any enforcement notice um, by, uh, if you, by regular and certified mail. We do, we do both. Okay, good. Uh, because there's a presumption that that, that has been, been received if it's not returned as returned to sender. 
uh, but you know it goes back to the you know the the resources of the town and what circumstances are worthy of enforcement i mean if something is if you're on it early um, and you know you a letter can a letter can be issued you know first by you and if it's ignored a uh, town attorney letter can go and say that you know if you don't bring it into compliance within such and such a time then an enforcement action is going to be brought in the superior court but you know you need the authorization you know the of uh you know of you know the town manager slash council to have the support to be able to bring bring a, a lawsuit mm -hmm. but that's really the statutory mechanism if they're going to ignore you the only other place to go to force compliance is the court actually so I have, uh, I remember seeing as I have the privilege or whatever it is of going way back. I suppose the other thing is to put a lien against the property, which simply sits there and they can't do anything with it until that lien is satisfied. And yeah, it may take 30 years, but it will, somebody's going to have to do something at some point to fix it. Well, you're, you're not necessarily going to love my answer on this one in that, that the, the general statutes have general powers to municipalities come out of 7148 and ordinances have been adopted for a long, long time. Towns will adopt, you know, unregistered un, you know, motor vehicle ordinances. Uh, and there is a statute for blight, blight liens. Mm -hmm. um, and and fines. Well, in in your case, the fines that um, that you can get are only issued by the court, um, and they're not issued by. We don't. Yeah, pardon me. We don't want. We don't want and, fines. We just want a workman's lien. It, but you haven't done any. You haven't done work. So where do you, where do you get the authority for a work? Somebody somebody has done work. I think what so, we've done in the past, Vasek, is. Um, they've done something through the building department because they mm -hmm. haven't had a building permit. Exactly. Work. And the, so it wasn't really our lien necessarily, mm -hmm. but they've filed, put a lien on the property um, through that mechanism instead. And I think that the one that most recently happened was um, that bungalow that was just flipped on, is it Woodland? No. Kim, help me out Willard. here. Willard. Willard. Um, that house had a lien on it because they had pulled out all the windows. And when the new owner came in and flipped the house, they had to replace all the windows. I don't know how Jack Bradley was the town attorney at the time. So I don't know exactly how that, that was worked out, but I think it was done through the fact that they didn't have a building permit for all the work. That they had done. Yeah. yeah, probably. Cause you, you're just, the, the statutes for historic district don't give automatic lien authority the way that no, but tax collector has the ability to put means right. on it. And that was the problem. That's the biggest problem we have when we look at these houses that we know they've done. Usually it comes up in the context of windows, but other things too. You know, are we going to have the town incur the cost of a lawsuit, which is going to result in a fine that's probably not going to be paid and then a lien on the house? you know, we're um, not greeted warmly at town hall with those actions in most mm -hmm. circumstances. So it puts us in a really tough spot, but you know, it is the situation we're in. We try to do it by the letters first. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had a, the town attorney send out letters on a couple of occasions, but not a ton. And, you know, some people come in and some don't. Mm -hmm. It's definitely so situation yeah. though one of the things that ken brought up is you know how we make the widow do something or other we never make anybody do anything we only approve things that when people want to make changes right and we simply say no mm -hmm. so even though a hundred of your neighbors have that same thing we just want to maintain oftentimes the status quo whatever is there stays and then people are unhappy the other question I have for you, Ken, is we, like many other boards, 
change over time. And the board today may view decisions that were made 20 years ago as mistakes. Mm -hmm. how, do we, um, how do we make those changes from our end? How do we defend what we see as a mistake that was made 20, 30, 40 years ago? And how do we support our changed view now? Well, that's an awfully nuanced question. Um, Sorry. I know, you, I know you appreciate that. No, no, I'm just, I, I got to give that caveat to begin with. So there's a couple of elements. The question was asked before about precedent. Well, you're not bound by precedent of the bad decisions that might have been made a while ago. Um, but here's what you're going to hate for me, maybe. Um, if, if, if it's come before the commission 40 times and and under the exact same facts it's been approved and then the commission changes you 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 need to have in order to support a change hopefully there's some good evidence in the record i'd have a fighting chance to support your decision on appeal if information came in that were you know, this is what historically was appropriate. Um, and there was a period of time where, yes, the commission might have done that, but they were wrong because historically this is what's appropriate. And a court could see all that evidence and say, all right, well, you know, it's maybe too bad for this owner that they're being held to, you know, a, a reasonable standard for what is historically appropriate in that property. And the you know the prior members of the commission, um, you know, really didn't strictly adhere to that. You'd have a chance to be supported, but you have a bigger risk there if somebody comes in and says, you know, drop plops down forty applications that the prior commission has approved, and suddenly you don't. So the best way to change would be to support your decisions, have some support in your decisions under the factors that we went over as why somebody changing a physical fe feature on the property is incongruent with what should be done considering the historic considerations that you're, that you're charged with. So you should not be married to what they've done before. There's not a strict precedent, but if you've got a commission that was so entrenched for so long and allowing people to do something and you're the first commission to, to flip, you know, there's some risk that a court might say you can't do that. It's there's no way I can't give you a nice black and white answer on that. But your best bet would be to, to just have legitimate evidence upon which you are you are determining that those factors, um, under all of those factors, they shouldn't be able to change from from you know or install make this change that they're proposing. Uh, and a court shouldn't it, that would give somebody like me. A reasonable chance to defend your decision because you've got to support it, even though I think you might have had a different view before. I think where it comes up um, for us most often is we're faced with new products all the time. You know, manufacturers are constantly evolving, and especially with our windows, um, coming out with new composites and new styles. And you know, so maybe we'll give it a shot on a particular house, and the installation will just be horrible and it'll look really bad. And so someone else will come in and we'll be looking at that one example we had where it went awry and think, oh, we really don't want to have that happen again. Um, you know, it's a tough call if we're in a, a house of a similar era in a similar location. Um, you know, I think our opinions differ across the commission as to whether we should cut our losses and never let it happen again, or if we're forced to let it happen or risk a lawsuit when the when the thing is such a close call like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why <laughs> there is nuance in that question. So I have a question. This is Claire. That's not very nuanced. It's easy. Um, I want to take it back to administrative and applications and Kim's role. Um, one of the things that always happens um, given the way we accept applications, Kim's only in the office some uh, of the time, and applications are accepted and stamped as being accepted that are not complete. And then Kim spends a lot of time tracking down pieces or doesn't get them 
and they come in for the first hearing and then we inevitably table them because we don't have enough information. Um, it's a lot of Kim's time. So if we were to come up with administratively an internal process for that for a certain set of applications, let's say for five types of applications, we have a checklist of what has to happen. And if it's not there, we're gonna say no. And the building department agrees to pick that up and do that. Where do we note that? Do we put that in our handbook? Where do we publish that? Or do we just let people figure it out when they get to the counter and are told that they can't file their application? Well, we say can't file the application. I mean, there was, um, there was a decision that just came out of Hartford a couple of years ago, within, within the last year, actually. And it involved staff's decision-making as to whether or not it was a, a land, it was land use, not historic district, but it was a, a special permit application. And staff made a determination that the applicate the application was in it was um, you know, was non-compliant, insufficient information was provided and it was denied. And, and that was reversed. Um, so if somebody files something with you know with a filing fee and an application and it's woefully deficient, uh, your commission really needs to deny it as opposed to, I'm not gonna allow, I mean, staff can say you're wasting your time um, and, and where, to your point, where do you put that information? You could have it in, you know, your app, you could, you could create an application form guidelines of things that, that have to be submitted. And then when I show up at the desk with my check and I want it to be uh, approved, and, uh, and, and Kim tells me it's not going to get approved because I don't have this, this, and this. Most reasonable people are going to walk out the door and get those other things. So you could put them in your handbook. You could put it in an application package if somebody wants to get an application and it has a checklist of all the things it has to have. Um, and if they don't have it, um, it's going to get denied. But I don't think Kim should be just saying we're not going to accept it and process it at all if it gets filed. I mean, I guess the good news, you know, with uh, it, yeah, I, I think that's you know that that's problematic to to do it that way. I mean, it'd be more encouraging. Don't don't waste your time. Please come back when you've got all of these things with a nice, sheet, clear checklist. And I'd like to think <clears throat> most people would not force the issue and file it um, when it's not compliant. But if they do, you don't have to work with them if you don't want to. If it's not compliant, the next meeting, somebody can make a motion to, to deny uh, because it's not compliant and be done with it. Seems reasonable enough. Can I just make a quick comment about that? I do have a checklist. So if somebody wants me to email them, I will often email out the application, a checklist to help them get through the application and a list of meeting dates and deadlines. So that's those are my usual three that go out. Um, and then if it happens to be the other 30 hours that I'm not in the office, that it comes back in, building does try to get uh, make sure that there is supporting documentation to go along with the application. A lot of times, half of it is missing. Um, today, I sent one back because I held on to it for a few weeks and um, kept calling and emailing and saying, I need, I need to have this documentation. There's absolutely nothing here. And it's date stamped. So if we get to that 65 days, we get to that point where a decision has to be made. Um, so the secretary emailed, um, mailed the um, application back with their, um, to the window company with their, um, with their fee. And it doesn't happen very often. Most of the time they will get me their, their information. It's, it's not always timely, but we do the best we can. So Ken, well, in that the, situation, the, the, does mm -hmm. our clock start ticking if we haven't, um, cash the check and haven't formally accepted it you know i'm always worried about that the clock to act on an application well the good news is 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 that they don't 
get one automatically approved if you miss the deadline. I believe that you don't have like a land, the land use statutes have very specific, it's, it's received on the next regularly scheduled meeting or 35 days thereafter. Uh, the historic st district statute does not. It's just based on receipts. So it wouldn't be the, the check cash, but the good news is if you've missed that 65 days, it doesn't automatically get approved. Um, so I, you still ought to, my recommendation, as I said before, you still should follow it. And if the person is, you know, boneheaded enough after they've been told that they need, you know, X, Y, and Z documents, and they, they refuse to provide it to you, and you're up against, you know, up against the deadline or close to it, just deny it for not, you know, not being compliant. But I know, you know, you're, you're, what you're doing, what Kim's doing, what the staff is doing, is trying to help people be compliant, not deny applications because they've missed some technical requirement. So right. I get that, um, and that's the the ideal circumstance. Uh, but if somebody is just being that recalcitrant, there's really not a huge huge risk in saying as much as I said before in response to Claire's question that. You know the commission, the, the staff shouldn't really deny an application. There's not because of the, the there's no automatic approval. If staff sends it back because it's so woefully deficient, um, you know the person doesn't really have. A, there's really not any real risk to the town. The, the person needs to file something that's compliant to get your certificate. Um, so I, I don't have a problem with her doing that. Uh, but I, what I do, I would have a problem with her taking a decision that it's denied. She can't do that. Uh, but is if, if it's so bad um, and the person's not being responsive, sending it back with a checklist saying, look, <laughs> get this information in and then it'll get processed. Um, and then, then you do it. And if somebody's close enough so that it's on the docket, I think it's 65 days runs from the date that it gets stamped in and that's not the case. And holding on to the check wouldn't extend the time. Does anyone else have any other questions for Ken? I think this has been really useful for us. Um, I certainly appreciate your time tonight. And uh, I did learn a couple new things because I we have always treated that deadline as it would be approved if we didn't act on it. So it's nice to know that that's not the case. And also, I don't think it's ever happened, but we have had meetings where we've only had three people um, appear. And I didn't realize that we would all have to be unanimous in that situation for it to pass. Um, so that's a good tidbit for us to know too. And one thing you can do in that world, which is I see ZBAs do, because ZBAs have a requirement for four affirmative votes. So there, there are seven member commissions. And uh, a lot of commissions, if only four people show up, uh, a commission chair will often say, it's your your prerogative, you know, Mr. and Ms. Applicant, uh, but you need to know you have to get a unanimous vote tonight if you're going to get approved. Would you prefer that we continue it to the next meeting uh, so you have more people? You, you could extend that. Now, now that you understand that heightened vote, you could extend that courtesy in an instance in which you have a, uh, a bare, bare majority attend. That's good to know. I definitely you don't have to, which could. Yep. Okay. That sounds good. Very good. Anyone else have anything? All set for tonight. All right, folks. Well, if anything, you know, you, you think of anything else that comes up afterwards, uh, please uh, reach out. I'd be more than happy to answer your questions. Great. Thanks so much. I appreciate your time very much. Oh, um, thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Appreciate it.